we invite you to join us as we dive into the history and influence of Appendix N. We'd like to open our library to you and inspire readers to explore these new worlds. I am one of your hosts, Keeper Bob, and with me tonight, as always, is Keeper Jen. Good evening. And does Keeper Jen still have her guest star over on her desk? Uh, yes, we have uh, the notorious Mouthy Vance. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm really sorry if you hear this. Uh, notorious VNC? God. Uh, Yes, I, I'm bribing him with a licky stick right now to shut the heck up so that we can talk. <laughs> so well, hey, we're here. Let's, we let's are, talk we are about here. a book. One of one of my so, favorite authors, right? Yeah. So tonight we're going to continue our exploration of uh, Appendix and Adjacent Works with Horrible Imaginings by Fritz Leiber. So why don't you and Vance tell us about that, Jan? Oh boy. Uh, well, with a career spanning more than 50 years, Fritz Leiber's work influenced generations of writers and fans. Although his novels are best known for fantasy devotees, uh, his short fiction is less easily found as a whole. Assembled from magazine submissions, fanzines, and even lost manuscripts discovered amongst the author's personal papers, Horrible Imaginings includes the following short stories. Uh, the titular uh, Horrible Imaginings, The Automatic Pistol, uh, I'm going to but butcher this one, sorry, uh, Crazy and Nowage, it's Joanna backwards, Let let's just look at it that way. The Hound, Alice and the Allergy, Skinny's Wonderful, The Answering Service, Scream Wolf, Mysterious Doings in the Metropolitan Museum, When Brahma Wakes, The Glove, The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, While Set Fled, Diary in the Snow, and The Ghost Light. And I don't know, uh, if any of our viewers have read these with us, but I think of the 15 stories, um, there's something in here for everybody. Most, most definitely, most definitely. As a matter of fact, while we talk a little bit about Fritz Library, if any of our viewers have been reading along with us, maybe they can chime into the chat with their favorite short story from the collection. And just to make sure that we don't overlook a fan favorite. Uh, but I mean, this is this is Fritz Leiber, right? I mean, it's it's Fritz Leiber, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. That, that's why I was pushing for it. Uh, that said, it's Fritz Leiber at varying uh, times of his career. And one could argue varying uh, levels of talent. Well, oh, I don't, I don't know as I would use that particular phrase. Uh, but let, let, let's talk a little bit. There about, are some about, pieces that are more polished than others, but yes, we should talk uh, well, about. Well, yeah, first. okay. There are there are pieces I enjoy. <laughs> I will grant you that. Uh, but we're talking about Fritz Ruder Liber Jr., born the day before Christmas, nineteen ten passed away September 5th, 1992, which doesn't seem that long ago to me, but I'm old, so ignore me. Uh, he's a, and he was a Chicago boy, right? He was born in Chicago. He toured with his father's Shakespeare company, his father, the actor, Fritz Leiber Sr., obviously. Uh, and one of the last, he was one of the last members to join the, the famous Lovecraft circle. He had a very intense period of correspondence with Lovecraft for less than a year before Lovecraft died, like 1936 to 1937. And Lovecraft really had an impact on his writing style. And I think that that is a, that shows in a couple of these stories as we discuss them. His, his first professional sale was Tussaud Adventure, the introduction of Fawford and the Grey Mouser. He sold that to Unknown Magazine in 1939. Was his first, that's right. That was his first professional sale. He'd had, you know, other you know, small things published in, in zines and the like, but uh, 
but yes, yeah, so that was his first professional sale. He was a founding member of the Swordsman and Sorcerers Guild of America, Saga, which included people like Luke Carter. And uh, okay. of course, of course, as we are all all uh, so fond of pointing out, Liber himself is credited with inventing the term sword and sorcery in the journal uh, and Caligon. And Caligon. Uh, and that was back in the 60s? 1961. And that's one of the reasons I thought this book would be so interesting to go through because it wasn't just sword and sorcery because we've we've done the crap out of Lankmar, right? We, we've reviewed Lankmar so many different times and we've had so much to do with the, of course, the DCC Lankmar setting. Uh, so well, and every fantasy I, city is just a reflection of Lankmar, so. That is, that is very true. And uh, sometimes people even admit that that's their inspiration. Uh, but no, with the style of writing in these particular stories, I thought it would be really interesting to tackle something that wasn't just sword and sorcery. And it turns out that all of his stories seem to have these elements of mystery or suspense to them, even supernatural horror maybe, but there's always something mysterious going on in almost every single thing that he writes, at least as far as my experience has shown uh yeah he was he, he really enjoyed instilling a a sense of suspense into his work and, and it really shows in some of the in some of the other things that he is known for outside of appendix n circles and uh, you know i have to credit our our friend and fans fabor who hooked me up with this quote uh, from Michael Swanwick, who says, I once asked Li Liber if it was not possible that Nawan was actually a horror venue disguised by the fact that Fawford and Mouser always escaped the consequences of their actions. And Liber responded, everything I have ever written is horror. Yeah. <laughs> and, wow. Um, that that kind of makes me think about these other stories uh in even from the Lankmar series in a completely different light well and 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 while while it is a great quote looking looking at this i would i would have to say that while may, while perhaps intended that way it is not horrorness it is not all horror by today's standards right i mean Horror, has, the, the genre of horror has changed just as much as fantasy and science fiction have over the years. Um, but, but yeah, there is there's certainly an underlying current of menace, I think, in, in everything that he does. And I menace mean, is different than horror, though. Well, menace, menace leads to tension, tension leads to horror, horror leads to king i don't know um, but, 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 but especially seems... especially with his association with lovecraft uh, and and even Lovecraftian horror, which which is kind of its own you know, subgenre of horror, uh, often doesn't resemble what is typically seen as horror. I and mean, so, there there can be horrific elements that aren't uh, malign, but okay, I'll, I'll I'll give you that. Yeah, and and we'll we'll certainly we'll certainly uh, get to a story that that has just that sort of thing in this collection. Um, but but if we're going to talk about Lyra, we have to at least mention the fact that over the course of his career, he won six or seven Hugo Awards, uh, two Nebula Awards. Uh, he was uh, the, the inaugural uh, winner of the Bram, Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Horror Writers of America. Um, he was the second Gandalf Grandmaster of Fantasy, uh, the first being Tolkien. He was inducted into the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. He won at least two World Fantasy Awards, as well as being, as well as receiving one from uh, from them for Lifetime Achievement. I mean, this is a this is a highly uh, 
honored and an awarded Decorated. author. Yes. Uh, it was it was frustrating because when I was when I was doing a little bit of of research and looking around on this, so I'm like, well, you know, this lesser known author, Fritz Leiber. I'm like, are Uh, yeah, that. That's I a just sort of, I sort of had nothing at that point. I mean, what, what do you say other than? I mean, I, I'm seeing yeah. everywhere that uh, one of his early stories in this collection that I believe you and I both enjoyed uh, was overshadowed by one of its contemporaries in every review. So it was kind of the overlooked child back in 1940. Oh, I know what story you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, these these stories range from uh, novellas to what the editor calls short shorts, like maybe two and a half pages. While in, Seth in fled novel. was definitely a short short. Um, as was uh, When Brahma Wakes. That, that was a very short feature. Uh, and they were all written between 1940 to 1984. So we have a 44, 45 year span of his writing. And it's almost like you can tell which ones were being done on a particular deadline because some of them were, they came across as more well-written and less um, shall we say stream of consciousness <laughs> well i mean some of the some of the earlier stories certainly written written for the pulps those those had to be uh, be be turned out on a on a fairly uh, quick timeline if you wanted to make money and and you see that in in all the great uh, pulp authors right I mean, howard burroughs lovecraft Dawson, Vance, yeah you know, yeah they 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 churned out a lot of work because that's they were writers and they were paying their bills and uh, that is that is something that a lot of writers today can't say so uh yeah well you don't have to be so harsh on yourself bob <laughs> <laughs> i will never pay my mortgage as a writer uh it also felt like a lot of these stories could be televised or maybe had been um and we'll get a little bit more into that uh, as we go, but as a teaser, I was reminded that Conjure Wife, although not in this collection, uh, was made into features four times. Uh, once was an episode of Moment of Fear. Uh, the other three times were actually films, Weird Woman, Witch's Brew, and Night of the Eagle. Well, was, Night of the Eagle was actually a separate piece written by him, because I know there was at least one or two films named Conjure Wife. Um, it, this was specifically one based on the writings of Conjure Wife, and Night of the Eagle was the one that was also known, known as Burn Witch Burn, which solidifies my... It's not my, at all. I know, I know, but it, it really... As I was reading a lot of these including one that I enjoyed and I know you didn't uh, because you know there were a lot of stories and we actually did talk a little bit you know in between them not about specifics but just oh that was good oh hated that <laughs> uh, but I had this really strong comparison to Abraham Merritt in especially the style that he would leave off in some of these stories um so yeah the the correlation with the burn witch burn yeah yeah i'm 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 good good with this one <laughs> well then uh why don't why don't we especially since there are so many stories and because we could talk for hours about fritz Leiber just from our experience on the Lankmore project alone why don't we oh, why don't yeah. we then start talking about some of these stories uh and well, we do have, uh, we're, we have we're, in, in the chat, uh, yeah. Deidre's favorite story was The Glove. Loved okay. hating the nosy neighbor and the creepiness of the moving glove. And that, that is a great story. Why don't we, why don't we actually, I know it's not first in the collection. Why don't we start? No, no, that, that's just fine. <clears throat> um, 
I, I was hoping not to start with the first one in the collection anyway. <laughs> I, so the, the, I glove, so glove. the glove originally appeared in Whispers in 1975, and it's kind of a sci-fi mystery. Kind of. I don't, I don't see a sci-fi element to it at all. There's more of a horror element to it, right? I mean, there's this, this woman's been attacked in her apartment and uh, by, by this mysterious assailant and this glove is left behind and the glove is then left with her neighbor and the glove begins to move well yes that that that's true there's i apologize less of a sci-fi and more of a superstition um well, well and it's just it's it's yeah. creepy right i mean that's but you want to talk you had mentioned in the intro of of things that have those supernatural qualities that aren't mm -hmm. necessarily malevolent. And, uh, you know, you, we can't really spoil a story that is as old as, as this is. Um, the glove comes off very creepy. It's, you know, he's, he's waking up because something is touching his throat. And as it turns out, the glove is not the villain of the story. It is instead trying to bring that villain to justice. And, and and it's just it's such a wonderful tale it's it's so creepy it is like internet it, it easily could be an uh, like an internet meme youtube or uh, like 4chan forum story about this glove Easy there. <laughs> well, well the it, x forum is all yeah. about natural it, um, it could easily be creepy pasta yeah and it's 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 delightful it holds up and and I think that's something we find in a lot of these stories is they hold up. Um, sure, some of the technology might be, you know, technologically, there's always going to be differences, but the stories themselves hold up. And that one certainly does. And the, um, the notes that I wrote down for this one were that uh, gloves were just envelopes for hands. Yeah. And uh, there was a superstition about wearing the fra the flayed skin of another's hand, and that you would do such a thing to work magic. Yes, and you know if if one didn't, one certainly should, right? It just it has <laughs> it has that that creepy yeah. feeling. And uh, I mean, there are a lot of these that you could definitely just turn them on their side and and use them as gaming inspiration and i love that about language well, writing yeah yeah and and there's several stories in this collection um including the glove that really feel like something out of the old alfred hitchcock presents series where you've got these yes. stories that are leading up to, to you know, death or murder or insanity, you know, like Alice and the Allergy, Skinny's Wonderful and the Glove. They just uh, all have that, that vibe where you just have that music and a profile coming into frame uh, b before the story. Any of these are, are so infinitely adaptable. Uh, now, you, you mentioned Alice and the Allergies, um, that one being from 1946, a little earlier in his career. It is a bit of horrific fantastical mystery and it really tries for this visceral imagery but i didn't think it was actually written with enough panache to drive it home well again um it was it was written close to 80 years ago well, and, yes, and so yes. what was what That's was visceral true. and shocking would have been very very different um Fair point. Fair point, sir. Yeah, you know, just, just as as the difference in, in cinema, but I don't I don't think it was going for graphic and gruesome. Um, although it was certainly it, it certainly would fall into a, what I would consider an early attempt at body horror in some ways. Disturbing. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, but body horror is a genre, right? I mean, and and the thing is the the main character, the main character of the story is not the protagonist of the story. And that's, to, to me, that's a real interesting uh, bit of, of literary leisure domain. We have the husband, okay. he is our main character, but it is his wife 
who really is the protagonist of the story. It is her fears. It is Alice's experiences. And those those experiences are, are pretty dark. I mean, we're, we're talking like uh, ABC after school special sort of dark. And uh, sorry. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I mean, really, I mean, that's so so it's it's really dark and she's having these reactions and and her husband the doctor is trying to get to the root of it but at the end of the day his experience is far outweighed by by hers and her ultimate fate and it it, it i think that it's ending as written was not a common as commonly used of a trope as it is now uh, the ending where, oh, well, now this little slip of paper falls out and shows, oh, well, this is where this was from and this is what ties everything together. Um, it's almost it, like he was writing it with the intention of being televised. <laughs> uh, probably probably not in 1940, but, uh, but certainly that sort of thing was, was used by, by Rod Serling, who is a fan of libraries, um, as, as well as, you know, so you saw things like that in in night gallery in the twilight zone in one step beyond and, and all of the others that that sort of twist that isn't a twist more of a more of a reveal but the fact that this woman has been living in abject terror and it's growing as her allergic reactions are growing and then they discover oh well it's just you're just allergic to dust but but we've we've checked against household dust before. Can yeah yeah that's the one that i'm okay with not giving the spoiler to because it just didn't sit right well it is it is a disturbing story and uh and, so and i suppose i should give it a little bit more credit for that but the the dialogue and everything it, it just didn't seem as polished as it could have compared to other things written around the same time that's why i was like well this didn't fall into my favorite well, I mean, it, it certainly, it wasn't, it wasn't among, among my favorites in the collection, but I mean, it was also written for what, weird tales, right? So we're talking fast turnaround fiction. Yeah. So, and, and that, that certainly shows, but it's not, it's not a bad story. It's just, it is a disturbing story. And uh, honestly, it is, it is the type of, of story uh, these days that would probably come with one or two trigger warnings. So. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, so, so, so there is that. Let's pick one that you liked. Well, I mean, what do you want to I, talk about? Not, not that I hated any of these stories, but let's talk about the automatic pistol. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I can do that. Adored the automatic pistol. Um, it's it's one of my favorite pieces in this in this collection, and uh, I think the best way to think about it is as opposed to a weird western, it's more like a macabre mafia story right yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of it's its own weird little creepy genre and that that every once in a while is a story is generated in um everything is is so subtle as it as it builds and there's this there's this uncertainty amongst amongst the characters and the reader really um is something supernatural happening you know this this, this guy has has his his is his automatic pistol they even refer to it at one point as his familiar mm -hmm. uh, directly directly linking it to the concept of a witch's familiar as he's whispering to it in with sweet nothings that nobody else can understand and and how another gangster comes to covet the gun and then mm -hmm. one is dead and the other now has the gun and the gun seems to take issue with and you know that gun only knows eight words and they're all alike and they're all loud yes it was oh, it was it was such a it was such a, a great story yes macabre noir macabre mm -hmm. noir uh king Gidra again is uh, it kind of nails it and it really is it's this this dark atmospheric story that again it's i mean it's mostly a set piece i mean the majority of the story takes place in a couple of locations where they're sitting around playing cards, either planning a job or laying low after a job. And, and so it's, it's just the, it's the banality of their surroundings with, 
with the eeriness of is this or isn't it and at the end they're not sure but they don't take any chances right i mean that's and that's really how it comes down they're like you know what we're not sure but we're just gonna we're just gonna take care of this oh yeah and and you know the narrator was no nose uh one of the other guys was uh glasses there was inky kozaks you got you gotta have yeah. those classic mob names right yeah, I mean, clearly set in either the 20s or 30s. This was published in 1940, so just a year after his first piece. Yeah, after his first... After, and, after Foffer the Grey Mouser, he went to Mobsters and Ghost Guns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talking about how uh, other people in there, they talked foreign. Uh, I, the quote I really liked was, I was a small-town policeman. But now I live a less hypocritical life. <laughs> yeah, and the characterization in, in the story, I mean, the story is, is maybe what, 10 or 11 pages, right? I mean, none of, with, with, the, with the exception of, of the titular story, none of these are incredibly long. But the, the depth of characterization that you get through these broad, almost caricature-like strokes really works. You have a feeling for who the characters are and and they they come off as as very real and very uh, very grounded down to earth realistic characters in a slightly strange situation. Uh, right. Uh, now speaking of the titular piece, um, I'm just gonna gloss over that one and explain that it was written for Playboy magazine and uh, that pretty much gives you the how and the why of the litmus test on the first paragraph and uh, I, I wouldn't say if I, you I, weren't interested and you moved on to something else I don't blame you <laughs> I wouldn't I, 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 I want to I stop I wouldn't say it was written for Playboy magazine this is where it first appeared Firestarter first appeared okay. serialized in, in Playboy magazine. Play, yep, yep, yep. Playboy okay, was more okay. than pictorials. I, 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 should, I should cast less shade then perhaps, but I can also... But it wasn't a great story. I can also safely say that it wasn't the best choice to start this book out with. Um, but, yeah, yeah, no, it, it but, really wasn't. It had a great title. I think that's why. That's why I mean, I've, I've got <laughs> I've six of them in my stack of well written, and I've got three more that I thought were excellently done. And I mean, that's nine out of the 15 stories right there. Well, we talked about one of my favorites. We, we talked about King Keeper's Day. Why don't we talk about one of your favorites? Um, I. Honestly, the last three in the book were in my best of category. Um, I could actually start with the short short, uh, While Set Fled, and it's maybe three pages long, but it was mm. brilliant. Uh, set in Egyptian times, everybody's well, pretty much bugged out i it's, shouldn't it's say not, egyptian times yeah it's not but, set in um, egyptian times we're, we're looking at we're looking at the robert e howard version yeah, that's of, true. of set we're looking at hyperborea and conan but i'm i'm getting the the i'm getting the atmosphere from it just in this three pages and they're fleeing uh because of political reasons and and invasions incoming of incoming army. armies and so they're thieving from their own house is is how it's put yeah um, and so the invaders find the place has already been emptied there's nothing for them to loot they get to the very top of the tower where the uh quote-unquote crafter is and the crafter is preparing a spell and creating an idol or an effigy. If I didn't you will. notice he was creating a spell so much as he He's was he was working. melting he was melting down a, a sword and creating creating oh, something that he could it, carry. It was a it was obviously a magical artifact, and I I, I, I really that. got that. I, I just thought it was a really good uh, immersive 
three pages. Well, and what I really enjoyed about the story is, you know, first of all, it it quite neatly encapsulates why why he's running, why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, the household servants have already stolen everything else made of bronze because the Hyperboreans prize bronze. He has this bronze short sword. He knows he cannot leave carrying a weapon because he's going to be struck down for certain. So he's melting it down into, into, a, in, into an idol, into an image that he can carry with him, which is, which is not an image itself of Set, as it is a serpentine woman. But what I love is how everything wraps up. As, as he is trying to finish and they come in and they behead him and his body continues pouring for two or three more seconds before his blood breaks the flow and the, and the image is finished perfectly without an upper sprue or pour mark. Uh, and I really tell I really me that's not it. an artifact. Come on. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think it's an artifact. I think it is it is some wonderful imagery. It uh, is by far the shortest selection and possibly the most powerful. Uh, it's it is a very powerful piece. It's a very evocative. But piece. At least until the next two pieces. And one of them I know it was oh, yeah. really powerful. At least, yeah, until we get to the next one. Okay, so let's let's talk, let's talk about a, a story that I think you and I certainly disagree on our enjoyment oh. let's talk about the hound shall we um, ah, the, I, liked it. I i enjoyed most of it you know the, the the man being being haunted by the sounds of this kind of demonic hound and it's getting closer and he's starting to see it i loved all that and then we get to the end and we we get to the end and it was like quag keep all over again i was like that 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 slap done wait but there's you literally ended the story mid sentence and have resolved nothing oh and and that sentence was hound wolf it was nothing like that it was oh you should come inside and uh, honestly that was that had a little bit of similarity to merit from my experience reading Merit. I, I didn't like the overall ambiguity to the ending in, in that we don't know, you know was, was he in danger? Is he still in danger? What was your, there's, there, in, for me, there was too much left unresolved. Uh, you know, one or two well, things unresolved, that's great. But when essentially the entirety of the story is left hanging, I'm I'm not as big of a fan of that. The lead up to it was was wonderful. Um, hell, the, the city itself was almost its own character, but the, yes, the end for exactly. me left a lot to be desired. And with new environments being created, inhibited emotions are accumulating, and culture becomes ripe for infection. Uh, yes, that the city is an entity usually viewed as negative and that is one of the overall themes that i got through a lot of these stories uh, also things like the weather forcing your actions or your inactions um, in this case you know there was pay, a chase scene stories. at the end that corresponds to that long predicted blackout as yeah. the the roar of the city just becomes I, I think the city itself was the wolf so well, that, quite, quite possible and i mean there is the the whole being pursued and trying to find shelter and there being a blackout is itself shows it shows a lot of lovecraft's influence uh, lovecraft has a has a, a story that is similar that, uh, that also doesn't tell us what the horror is, but at least lets us know what happened to the guy. Just saying. Uh, yeah, well, the, the guy is rescued at the end and feels a weight off of it. Maybe. Uh, Maybe well, rescued at the end. It's it's not really resolved if this thing has been, been continuing to hunt him. But he felt the weight removed. And overall, <laughs> just the, the droning of the city and the louder and louder until all of the sounds just blend into one and all of the oh 
yeah, the, it's really a commentary on on progress in a lot of these as well. I, I can see that. I can see that. Um, you know, with with progress, uh, let's let's talk about a story that to me felt it felt almost like a piece by uh, Bradbury more than Liber. Uh, hmm. Other other than other than I would say the the science fiction elements answering service mm. to me was very Bradbury-esque in that you've got it, 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 I mean it's it's one it for for the majority of it it's it's really one person you, you've got one side of a phone conversation and then other bits that you're not really sure is that another person on the line is this pre-recorded tapes which god is that current because how many times have you picked up the phone hello oh i was preparing my answering machine voice let me ask and of course it's a recording so well and, let let me counter then uh it could actually you know besides being a little prescient on that end um the doctor himself is quoted as saying only get psychoneurotics to take that job. Everyone else demands a social working life. And he's referring to the people who have to take those calls. Yes. Well, and, and as we as we learn, and, and by the by the end of the story, we know that the person on the other end of the line is real. But I mean she's she's in a cubicle surrounded by these tapes that get that get played to answer general things. And as the story is progressing, because of the way she repeats certain things. You're not really sure through most of it if she's real and this this elderly woman is a horrible human being or if she's a tape and this elderly woman is a horrible human being and if it's a tape is if it's a tape i'm a little concerned because one of the things well by that, the end we know it's not well one of the things this woman says to the old woman who calls uh, is shining horrors and shining horrors sounds really really uh yeah absolutely love crap well and, <laughs> and, and again, really influenced is, by that this this is a piece that would have been perfect for something like the twilight zone in the way that right in the way that it, it builds right the, the mm -hmm. knowledge the tension build but we have we have that poor woman on the other end of the phone who begins sort of slipping and hinting at things that are later revealed when she refers to the the old woman as mother a couple of times and we start getting to what had happened to her mother she's like look you know you're, you're berating me because you don't have your your medication but your phone has a teleporter in it and i can put a pill in your hand right now well, I don't have one of those. Oh, let me look. I'm sure. So, so we have those sci yeah, science yes. fiction elements, right? We have doctors flying around in helicopters. We have we have phones that that have transporters in them, and we the have matter transmitters. Yes, telekinetic gloves, so that you can sign checks from a distance, which the old lady doesn't trust. And frankly, I don't blame her for that part. But the way the entire story builds, and then the pill comes through. And then there's the flow of blood that comes through because she has driven the woman on the other end of the phone to suicide. It is such a dark, visceral ending to the story, especially as the old woman humps and smiles because sometimes bad people win. And that, you're right in that that was another one where it was told primarily through the uh, dialogue. Oh yes, um, it was, but it was it was such a, yeah. a great dark story. Oh yeah, we one of my notes on this one is that I could absolutely see this televised. Oh yes, well, and and speak, speaking of televised, let's talk about the girl with hungry eyes. You mean that one that I was reading? Going, I I know I've read this story before. I really feel like I've seen it too. Because because we watched that episode of the Night Gallery earlier. Here. thank you <laughs> uh, yes uh the girl the hungry eyes was one of two of library stories that were adapted for the night gallery and it was also made into a, a feature film in 1995 uh, i haven't seen it and the reviews that i have seen for it are very uh 
afflicting. Like what is the other short? I'm curious. Um, I believe it is the dead man. I'll have to. Okay. I'll have to look. It was okay. uh, the 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 first one was actually uh, on the first episode of the Night Gallery, and it's. It, I I went and looked to make sure it wasn't one of these stories. It's a man that, when told about a disease, manifests that disease, and when he is told he's going to die, he dies. His wife commits suicide. The doctor, overridden by guilt, decides to tell him about being alive. And that is sort of where the story ends. Uh, okay. But yeah, the girl, the girl, the yeah. hungry eyes, fantastic story. And uh, this was actually uh, an Avon book. It wasn't published in one of our short story uh, magazines, like Weird Tales. Right. Or fantastic. Uh, well, and Avon, Avon did a did a few collections of their mm -hmm. own. What I I really what I really liked about the story is the 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 titular antagonist, right? The girl with the hungry eyes. This this model who is never really named. Um, the way she is described as this psychic vampire born from like the projected collective desire of humanity. Um, that concept that that, that concept uh, predates something very similar done in a different way which was the cre the creature of the id in the movie forbidden planet um hmm. this is a much more down-to-earth version of desires manifesting but in its own way just as dark and deadly in that yeah, I, I read it with more intrigue or suspense than say mystery or horror but maybe that's because i'd seen and and read it before i, well, I, I didn't think it really fit the mold for but well, certainly it's certainly not really mystery right uh, i mean we've not from, really from the very get-go well not from the very get-go we've got the, the the photographer is warning us about about this this woman who is not a woman about these deaths that are linked to her and the maybe murders the maybe murders and and how he's seeing you he's he follows her and he he sees her with this man and the next day that man is found dead but there's there's no there's no sign of violence or anything and he is confronted with with that with with the revelation of exactly what would happen and, and how it would happen and he manages to resist and flee by the end but but she is certainly she is no mortal woman she is something else the hunger in her eyes is real and she devours and that's like when he would be talking to her in the studio and he's well you know my mom did this and let me tell you about my dog and she's devouring essentially every piece of of his life and and that of everyone she comes into contact with she draws all of that in. And it's it must not make colin robinson reference okay um, <laughs> so i am what we I'm, do in the library I, um, yeah I, 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 I i'm not that. sure about that one I um, love that. It, it was a good story it it didn't excite me as much. Again, maybe because I'd I'd already been exposed to it. Um, I thought, uh, just as kind of a one-liner here, I thought Scream Wolf was almost a perfect mystery without carrying that Sherlockian level of intrigue. Um, and really, I, I would recommend uh, I would recommend that one for all crowds. Um, I would. I think we have time for maybe two more tonight. Well, I, then let's. I, what I was going to say, then we should definitely discuss yeah. Diary of the Snow. Okay, I, I was going to save that one for last. Well, then let's save I that know one that for we last. both loved that one. I have to say that I really, really, really enjoyed the Ghost Light. And it was one of his later writings. It was 1984, which kind of makes sense with the fact that it felt like I was reading one of those old short stories by uh, Dean Koontz or Stephen King even. Um, it's another that I could totally see televised. 
and the ending was fully satisfying. It was like the antithesis to the hound for you. Yeah, no, the the ending the ending of that story was very satisfying, and it's 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 very creepy, and it it it's funny because really the last two stories we're we're going to talk about both are shades of Lovecraft's From Beyond in 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 different ways. Um, in, in the ghost light, we've got the strange, we have the strange mechanism that, that is kicking mm -hmm. off these weird vibrations that are sending clouds of, of paint out. And uh, mm -hmm. it, is, it is a very eerie story. I would say, um, oh, not, not it, to me, I, I wouldn't say Kuntz so much as it felt more like John Saul. Uh, yeah, more like a there was a child in danger child in danger automatically is a john saul story i'm positive it was john saul but well it wouldn't fit for dean coons either because it was set in san francisco as opposed to new england but it's another case where the weather is clearly forcing their actions almost certainly and the city was viewed as negative yeah you know, the minute they got back into the city it was totally oppressing uh, I mean, there's more commentary on progress and complacency, and you know, well, just the just the addictive imagery, the, personalities, the the imagery of of the ghost light, this this eerie kind of greenish night light. It was that is, green that is and blue to, panels. Yeah, that's that's supposed to that's supposed to make the kid feel a little bit more confident. But what I absolutely love, and really, I. I adore this moment. You know, the kid wakes up and the nightlight's on and he's freaking out because grandpa had come through and saw the nightlight wasn't on. So turned it on, not realizing kid wasn't sleeping with the nightlight anymore. So the kid goes to sleep without this nightlight, wakes up in creepy light. I'm like, yeah, you know, um, yeah. I can see that happening. Uh, that's yeah, that the, the, the story ghost he probably me. saw was grandpa. But, uh, but it's, it's such a, it is such just a, a creepy creepy story and it's and got good elements of human i i mean good human elements as opposed to just uh telling the story through dialogue and it, it's it's and got it's, a little bit of everything and it's one of those stories where i mean we've we've got the port we've got the portrait of of grandma essentially right the, mm -hmm. Who has who has since passed, and no one's really sure of all of the circumstances around her death, including her husband, who by the end, you know, Grandpa's starting to think that maybe he had a little bit more to do with that, but he was drinking and wasn't sure, and so. And this is why he doesn't drink anymore. And so, but at the end, he's been driven back to drink. But we have mm -hmm. this we have this story of a vengeful spirit seeking you know seeking justice upon someone who doesn't even remember the crime and so that that really kind of ups in my opinion the 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 sense of horror in that it's it's something that you don't remember it's it's not that he's he's buried this it's not that he's hidden it away it's he was a he was a drunk and he got blackout drunk and well i remember being blackout drunk and you know the, the idea that that uh, someone is dead while i was blackout drunk would be terrifying and what really happened and so there's there's that entire sub level that mm -hmm. in my opinion it really has more suspense than the horror elements of the story no, I fully expected the, in this torrential rainstorm, uh, they get the warning that there's going to be a, a mudslide and, or a rock slide, and they're on this really fancy house overlooking the Bay Area, so they've got to evacuate. I was fully expecting the guy to get back there and find the house completely gone because he says, wait, dad hasn't actually gone to where he's supposed to go. Let me get the, the wife and kids safe. And then I'm driving back up the mountain. I, I have to yep, go. Gotta find out. Yeah. And I was fully, fully expecting in the spirit of the hound, 
the house is gone or the mudslide takes him in his car and he's never seen again. Oh no, he actually makes it to the house. He's able to go in the house. He's able to see what has happened to his father. We get that very Roger Corman, Vincent Price horror reveal at the end. That's a really good way to put it. And he is able to get the heck out of Dodge once he realizes there's nothing to be done here. And for a moment, the rock slide seems to want to take him and then it veers away. Yes. Like it's not his fault. Like it's and like like there is an intelligence behind it. Exactly. And speaking of guiding intelligences, then let's yes. let's, let's uh, speaking of the weather the forcing your actions. Harry <laughs> in the snow. Oh I mean this uh, this yeah. really is from beyond. It, it although it felt like I was reading a John Carpenter script. Uh, Diary in the Snow, 1947. Sure, uh, John, John Carpenter did uh, Prince of Darkness. Prince of Darkness was Lovecraft's Lurker at the Threshold. It's a Lovecraftian story. Yeah, no, I'm totally and, with you on that. And uh, uh, this one first appeared in Night's Black Agents, where Liber was still going by Junior at the time. Uh, Somebody really cool got me a copy of that. And this one, I, I thought the story unfolded wonderfully. It, it had exactly the pacing that it needed to. But um, this is, I mean, this is such a, a very clear and literal homage to Lovecraft from beyond, from the, the strange bluish purple violet energies from the aurora above to the strange unseen creatures that are coming through carried by strange energies which in this particular case are radio waves. Uh, it, and, it, and the guy uh, he's staying with doesn't know anything about this radio show that he's been listening to. And no, there's no such station. Them. You're yeah. just hearing a whole bunch of static. Exactly. As opposed to the ultraviolet, we have radio static. And the fact, the fact that the reason the characters live so long is because the person he's staying with is so aggrieved that he keeps waking up in the middle of the night turning off the radio. And that's why they <laughs> yes, live as I long as it. they do. Um, it, it, is, it is Lovecraftian in, in nature and design. Even the elements, the, the few descriptions of, of the portions of the creature, which are, which are squid-like, but as opposed to suc suction cups, there's these diamond shapes with odd threads coming off of them, and the touch of it stains the glass bluish purple. And freezes it even Because further. they are colder than what is on the outside. It is, yeah, oh, it, it, is, it is such a good story. It, it really is. Uh, and I did notice that after his, uh, we'll just call it the, the owner of the cabin, uh, after his roommate sees the purple light from afar and says, well, okay, maybe it could actually have been around our house, but then the narrator starts saying, no, no, actually, I think you were right with the auroral um, the diffusions and, and the way that things are, are distorted over here. And then the writer's block sets in after as, as he's denying the events because he yes. is he is holding at bay the the mental imagery and and really and then he the can't story, find the show that he's trying to listen to anymore well and where the story differs from from a lovecraft tale is we have we have our protagonist who's describing what's happening and then we see kind of the epilogue of the story from the other side of those energies as this thing has been waiting and trying to come through and this this weak will really mind, nice mind only had to to refuse and would have stopped him but but didn't and so it manages to come through and and then we get the the urban you know the urban legends of this giant black spider-like thing that moves in the icy woods so absolutely fantastic. Uh, 
my my favorite story out of the collection. I, I love the automatic gun, but this was my favorite story in the collection. Yeah, something told me it, it would be. Um, I mean, the ghost light, honestly, uh, parts of it reminded me so much of Shadow of the Beakmen, that that first DCC day module, and with the lantern and the and the different colored panes to it, and that that might be one of my ties. But also, I was. Yeah, Kuntz and Saul were some of my first uh, mystery authors when I was young. So we just <laughs> and we just lost Deep. So <sighs> yeah. So um. So well, I, yeah. I think that kind of thanks wraps for that up. bright shiny moment, Bob. <laughs> uh, we still have Saul, I think. I, rather, rather than dwelling on on things um, and and being complacent, which is something that Liber apparently doesn't like, uh, we, we should maybe move to something happier. Yes, I was, I was going to announce the, uh, the winner of our, uh, of our giveaway from, from last month. Uh, we, had, we had given away a story and we had, uh, we had our drawing for a complete set of the Circle of Light series. And the winner of our Circle of Light collection is Dennis Beecher. Oh, cool. Dennis, I don't know if Dennis is in the shout box tonight or not, but, uh, but he, uh, he is our winner. And cool. We'll save on postage, too. <laughs> and so, so with, with that announcement, I think it's time once again to announce a new pair of giveaways. Oh, one more for giveaways? our live audience, one for uh, for our viewers and listeners. So uh, that is right. Is it time? It is time. It is time to enter the Sanctum Secorum's very own prize closet. Of the prize closet of mystery. So this month we are giving away two copies of Ace Double F. 223 which is let's see here we go and that that's not that is envoy F to new worlds by keith lomer and the light what? from yesterday by robert moore williams and we lost the cover get a hold it in front of your shirt uh, magic so our uh, our first copy will go to the live viewer who can correctly guess the answer to the following question while often confused with his father, actor Fritz Leiber Sr., Fritz Leiber Jr. did make a number of film appearances. Which of the following is not a role he appeared in? A. Valentine in Camille, 1936. Hamlet's Vol Volatmond in The Great Garrick. C. The Genie in the genie in 1957 or okay. d dr waterman in equinox in 1967. Mm. let us see let us see if anybody is is with us in c c no, no. unfortunately canadian ancient gamer he did appear as the genie in the genie uh, no did he appear as fritz Leiber jr yes or actually he did okay. um King, King, you no, uh, he was Dr. Waterman in the original cut of Equinox. Uh, when it was recut, uh, he still appeared in it, but his character was unnamed. So, oh, to, Pax. Pax, no, Pax, he was, no. he was Valentine and Camille in 1936. I'm waiting now. I think we, we have gotten the <laughs> process of elimination. I think whoever can type the answer the quickest at this point is going to get it. <laughs> I'm thinking, yes, yes, Canadian Ancient Gamer, <laughs> who, whose capital B was turned into an emoji. Yes, it is B. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, he did not appear as uh, Voletmond in The Great Garrick. He instead was Hamlet's uh, Fortebrons in ah. The Great Garrick in 1937. <laughs> so, so we do have a winner. So uh, Canadian Ancient Gamer, go ahead and, uh, and drop us your contact information. Oh, that's too funny. The Hub at sanctum.media and we will uh, we'll get now, that Pax was thinking that it, uh, 1936 was too early that's why I was asking no 1936 was, was his first appearance and that's why he was still going as 
Jr. Actually, um, in, Val Jr. in Valentin, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, he was not credited. Um, a lot oh, of his wow. early roles, he was not credited. He appeared in uh, alongside his father in a version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, wasn't credited in that either. So, but yes, we we have. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, was, that was fun and exciting. That was fun and exciting. We, uh, we so. Uh, and if you didn't win the trivia question, or if you're simply listening to a replay of this show, you can enter to win the second copy of said feature day stubble by simply dropping an email to the hub at sanctum.media with your name. Entries should have the subject line prize closet of mystery. All caps give you bonus points. And that also means the rest of you here in the chat too. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And so now. We so have... first of all, we should mention uh, next month. Oh, we, yes. Next next month, uh, as we will be in route to Game Hole Con at our oh. regular time, yeah. we will instead be coming to you on the special day of October 30th, Sunday, October 30th. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sorry, uh, you, Sunday. you can't not. <laughs> you came for the book, but you only need the binding. I don't know. Um, uh, I've spent too much time with Jim Kitchen. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So this of course come, it comes to us, uh, which author and novel should we read for next month? And before we throw up the poll, we'll run through these real quick. We have uh, Hugo Gernsbeck, uh, who was uh, the man the Hugo Awards were named after, and his his book Ralph One Two Four C for One Another, One Two Four C for One Plus. Um, H. Ryder Haggard's She: A History of Adventure, which has not been out of print for 145 years. So that should be yeah. fairly easy to get. We have William Hope Hodgson's The House on the Borderlands, which was a book that was directly praised by Lovecraft. And entering our poll in honor of Halloween, Rogers of Lasney's A Night in the Lonesome October. I think you stacked the deck here. Bob. Let me tell you, when this when the vote goes live, I know where I'm going. Uh, oh, and it's gone live. I know where I'm going. Uh, keep keep in mind. I'm fairly certain that uh, that Elena has things set up. If you really kind of want to want to cheat or wait your vote with channel points. Oh I'm yeah, we have sure channel you, points. We I'm forgot to mention those. You can do that. You you could have been like asking for weird random facts from Bob. Channel points. Okay, so in the meantime, Bob, give us a random fact. A random fact. Why? Why do you go for? Yeah, let me rephrase that. Why are you voting for Zelazny? Why are you throwing extra points on it? <laughs> because I am. Um, a night in the lonesome October. Which the if if you don't want to read it and you prefer audiobooks, the audio version is read by Zelazny. It, it is, is entertaining. It's a it's a wonderful story. We've covered it before on. Uh, on uh, an early episode of the Sanctum Sacorum, and the main character is Snuff the dog, and you have oh, a, yeah. a gathering, a gathering of, of famed and supernatural entities, openers and closers, trying to bring about or stop the awakening of the great old ones, as told through the voices of their animal sidekicks and familiars. It is, it is an absolute favorite of mine. Of course, if you start reading it, you could literally start reading it on October 1st. The chapters are broken down day by day through the, through the month of October. Uh, so it is perfect Halloween reading. Oh, wow. Such and, a and I've got two quick messages before the voting is done here. Um, Canadian Ancient Gamer graciously released their prize to Desna's avatar. Oh, that's very kind of them. And Brick1321, thank you for your subscriptions. That is amazing. You rock. We'll tell you what, Canadian Ancient Gamer. Uh, <laughs> while we don't have three copies of this particular Ace Double, if you're going to be that kind, I think I'm going to reward that kindness. So go ahead and send us your address anyway, and I will find something else from the prize closet of mystery. We will send that on to you. We 
because we're a community and such good things deserve recognition. Because we're not afraid of postage? That too, that <laughs> too. And, and it is well, decided maybe. we will be reading A Night in the Lonesome October by Rock Plasma. Yay! Uh, well, uh, for a Halloween show, we'll bring the black cats. Um, yes. Feel free to dress up amongst yourselves. We, we won't be able to tell, but you know, you, you could fake it and, and just. We, uh, we, could, uh, you know, we, we could dress up. I mean, it could be a Halloween special. We, we, we could say. It's kind of predictable, though. Well, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. All right, folks. Well, thank you to, uh, to everyone who, uh, who joined us tonight for, for the live feed. And uh, for those of you who missed it, you can catch us on October 30th on the Goodman Twitch channel. And of course, I, I would be remiss if I did not point out that before our October 30th special, we have a special episode of Sanctum Live coming up on October 8th. Yeah. What's that, Saturday? A Saturday? Yeah, Saturday, October yeah. 8th. It'll be at 4 o'clock Eastern time. Ooh, outside of our normal window. Outside okay. of our normal window. Is uh, it worth it? It is, it is a show you do not want to miss as we, as, as we, we, the Keepers of Mystery, which is David Beatty, Mark Bruner, Jen, and myself, all four of us will be gathered Yay! together for 90 minutes with Michael Moorcock, discussing what? the new Elric novel coming out in December, as well as other things. He will be taking questions from, from the, uh, from the, Twitch stream Peanut gallery. So you uh, definitely yeah. do not want to miss your chance to uh, to ask questions of of Michael Moorcock. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm excited to get back together with both of my former co-hosts and and yeah, well, not not form Dave's not really former. We've all just no, been sort of but, busy. Yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, weird tales and and uh, um, weird frontiers that's it weird frontiers and oh yeah dying earth huh yes um, and now now yay I, and, I, and I get to cram all the elric into my ears yes and because it because it's on at 4 p.m eastern it means we will be on early enough that our friends across the pond over in the uk oh. uh, what a good Germany. idea, Bob. Everyone in Europe will, will have a chance to chime in as well. So everyone in the community is going to have their, their chance to, to hear the show and, and attend it live and, and get their questions answered. Oh, and thank you very much, Canadian Ancient Gamer. Oh, for, for this more very subs. Kind. Yay. Yeah. So. Uh, and again, email thehub at sanctum.media if you have any questions on this, uh, if you have any commentary you want to share with us, if you want to enter the drawing for the prize closet of mystery. Or if there is a book or author that you feel that we should be adding to our list of possibilities for our November show. Yeah. So we, are, we are always looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, and, uh, and for those of you who missed the October 8th show, um, you know it will be uh, recast here on Twitch. And yes, you you'll be able to catch, see us catch on it YouTube here later. on YouTube. And of course, it will and also, also on our feed. Sanctum.media. Yes. So everyone, thank you again so much for joining us this evening. And uh, we hope to see you all again very, very soon. Be inspired. Have a great night.